So the first time I ever played poker was in this building behind me. Obviously, I got my ass kicked, so I had a lot of animosity towards this spot for a while. But fast forward almost two years, and now it's actually one of my favorite places to play. Now, I know last video I said this vlog would be from the Gardens Casino, but as you guys may or may not have heard, LA has shut down their poker rooms once again. Pretty unfortunate situation since it seemed like things were getting better, but uh, I'm not really sure for how long the rooms will remain closed, but as you guys probably know, it's fine by me because Morongo is uh, 15 minutes from where I live, and like I said, one of my favorite places to play. The reason I say that is because you just can't beat this sort of environment. I much prefer this stuff to the concrete jungle that is LA. Hang on, this car is gonna try to ruin my video. But yeah, if you guys are looking for a place to play, this spot is still open. They've got the plexiglass dividers, it's seven-handed, and uh, it's insane in there every day. Yesterday, there were three tables of 510 going with a wait list of about 20 people. I think three tables of two five, uh, one three, one two, all of the above. It's all happening here at Morongo Casino. And today is Saturday, so I expect it to be bananas in there. As for myself, no complaints. Things have been going pretty well. Uh, I've been playing about two or three times a week and I'm actually in a little bit of a win streak. Without trying to spoil it, uh, maybe we'll keep that going today. If not, that's all right. At least it will satisfy all the people out there that think I only vlog when I win. Contrary to that popular belief, uh, I actually decide beforehand whether or not I'm gonna vlog a session and then whatever happens is what I end up posting. Anyway, enough of the chit chat. Let's head inside and play some 510 No Limit Texas Hold'em. All right, we are back at it here, guys, playing some 510 No Limit Hold'em. And we're gonna start things off with King Jack of Clubs in the under the gun position. I open for $35 and get called by the player on my left, the button, and the small blind. So we're gonna go four ways here to a flop of Jack 8-3 with one club. Great looking flop for our hand with top pair, great kicker. But when the action checks to me, Seeing as it's four ways and I'm not gonna have that many bluffs on this board, I decide to check it and exercise a little bit of pot control since there's so many players in this hand. The player on my left checks and the button checks as well. So still four ways here to a turn card, which is the six of diamonds. When the action checks to me for a second time, this time I am gonna put in a bet because there's a lot more straight draws and possible flush draws out there now that we can extract some value from. So I put in a bet of $100, the player on my left makes the call, and the other two players fold. Heads up here to a river card, which is the three of clubs. Pretty great card, I'm gonna continue betting for value. The question is, how much? And I think this is where I make a slight mistake, because I was thinking, you know, how much would I bet with bluffs? How much would I bet with good hands? I usually try to find a size that I would apply to all my holdings in a certain situation. And in this case, if I did have bluffs, such as queen 10 of diamonds, king 10 of diamonds, king nine of diamonds, hands like that, um, I'd probably be betting fairly large on this river card. 
As such, I decided to make that same size bet with an actual value hand, like I have in this case. I put in a pot size bet of $350, the reason I say this might be a mistake is because you can probably deviate from this and just try to target the certain player type that you're up against in a specific situation. And sometimes I fail to do that. I got the feeling this guy was not the type to call light at all. So if I did want to get a crying call from like pocket nines or maybe just a weaker jack, I should probably size down. But I failed to do that and I think it kind of backfired because he ended up just making the fold. So we don't get the value we were looking for and... If I had a better sizing on the river, I might have got called, but that's all right. Still happy to flop top pair in my first hand dealt. In the next noteworthy hand, I get involved in a dry side pot, which I do have some things to say about, but first let's get to that spot. So there's an early position limp and then another limper behind him. So two limps and then it gets to me in middle position with pocket queens. I raise it up to $60 and get called by the player on my left and the first limper. So three ways here to a flop of 964 with two spades. When the action gets to me, I would almost always advocate continuing to bet here, but the player in early position only has $60 behind, so I feel like it's not gonna be an issue getting in all the money against him. I figured I could really sort of see where I was at if I just checked and let the player on my left act, and if he checked it back, see what the early position player does on the turn. Anyway, so that's what I do, and the player on my left indeed does check it back. So we're off to a turn card here, which is the Jack of Spades. Kind of looks like it could be an ugly card, but I actually think it's a pretty great card because it seems that the player on my left would probably bet a flush draw, as well as the early position player would probably just go all in on the flop with a flush draw since he's only got 60 bucks behind. So I feel like, if anything, this card is going to give people top pair and maybe pair plus flush draw type holdings which are all hands we can get some value from with an overpair. So if the action checks to me, I'm definitely gonna be betting, but it doesn't come to that because the early position player does announce all in for his remaining $60. I don't think putting in a raise here is the right play, so I decide to just smooth call, and the player on my left makes the call as well. Now, this is where we get to the dry side pot that I mentioned earlier. There's three players in this hand, one of them is all in, and the remaining two players, which is myself and the player on my left, are gonna have a dry side pot going into the river. Now, what does that mean? It means that if I did have a bluff somehow, let's say I had ace king with a spade, and the river bricks off, there's really no point in me bluffing him out of the hand because I still have to beat the all in player at showdown to claim the pot. So you're almost like reverse free rolling yourself. I see this all the time, people bluffing into dry side pots. And unless you're doing that on the flop and turn to build a side pot and then try to steal it on the river, I guess, there's really no reason to do it. It's just a bad idea. And it seems like a lot of people don't recognize these situations. So just wanted to share my two cents about that. However, in this case, we don't have a bluff because we have a very strong holding. So when the river comes off the seven of diamonds, I'm gonna go for some value against one pair type holdings such as Jack 10 or King Jack or maybe even pocket eights or pocket sevens that are experiencing some trust issues. If I get raised, it's gonna be pretty nasty, but uh, I think it's strong enough to go for some value. Now, I don't wanna bet too large here since like I said, I'm not gonna have any bluffs and I'm just targeting one pair type holdings on a somewhat dangerous looking board. So I put in a bet of $100. My opponent thinks for a little while and eventually makes the call with ace jack with the ace of spades. If I'd known that was his exact holding, we probably could have gotten away with a pretty big raise on the turn, seeing as he's probably not going anywhere with top pair and the nut flush draw, but alas, it seems to work out anyway because he arrives at the river with a pretty strong hand, but just not strong enough to beat pocket queens. A few minutes later, I get completely owned by my buddy Paul when I have pocket aces against him, flop top set, and before I can even act, he folds out of turn. Talk about soul read. Way to make me feel terrible, Paul. So everything seems to be going pretty well so far in this 5-10 game. Smooth sailing, and we're gonna try to keep that going as we transition into this ace-jack hand from middle position. I open to $35, and only the big blind makes the call. So heads up here to a flop of jack-6-4 with two clubs. Amazing looking flop, plenty of draws for us to get some value from, as well as our very own backdoor nut flush draw top pair, top kicker, what else could we ask for? When the big blind checks, I put in a bet of $50, 
and he makes the call. So we're off to a turn card here, which is the three of clubs. And when he checks it to me, I think it's a close spot between checking and betting. I think it's fine to do a little bit of both. At the risk of sounding like Doug Polk, seems to me like both options have some merit. In this case, I decided to check it because if I put in a bet and get check raised, I'm not going to be too happy, honestly. So I just decided to check it back and see what my opponent does on the river. The river is the king of diamonds, which all things considered is not that good of a card. Not because I necessarily expect him to have a king actually almost ever in this situation, unless it was a hand like king jack, but that's about it. But the reason I say it's not a great card is because it makes it a lot more difficult for us to extract some value from hands that were a little bit easier to get value from before the king peels off, like queen jack, jack 10, maybe even pocket 10s, pocket 9s, hands of that nature. This card is just so good for us that our opponent will just be folding a lot more once we put in a somewhat thin value bet here if he checks it to us. But I'm still going to try. So when he checks it to me, I'm going to size down a little bit and try to get a crying call from second pair since we have the best possible second pair. So I put in a bet of $75. My opponent seems to want to think it over for a little while though before eventually deciding on a call. I show it and we win. So nice to get a little more value despite this somewhat awkward river card. Now, as you guys have seen, so far it's only been, you know, medium sized pots, chipping away a little bit here and there. But all that is about to change when a certain player walks in who I have a little bit of history with. I've played quite a bit against him and I'm happy to announce he is one of the most action players I've ever played with. Very successful in life and happy to gamble, admittedly so. Not really the type of player to shy away from action. So when he sits on my direct left, I know that this game just completely turned upside down because he is not going to fold any hand at all and he loves to put chips in the middle. So hope you guys are ready for that. Anyway, in the very first hand that my friend here is dealt, he opens to $30. The action folds all the way back to me in the big blind and I look down at ace four of spades. I make the call and we go heads up to a flop of ace queen four with the spade. So right off the bat, we flop a great hand against what I hope is a strong hand from my opponent here. I check it to him. He puts in a bet of $20. And even though I should have pretty much no check raises in theory on this board, I got two pair against an action player. So I'm going to raise it up. Let's make it $75. My opponent has $1,500, which is the max buy-in. And I'm happy to see that he does not call or fold, but instead puts in another raise to 220 this time. And I'm just going to go all in. If he has any ace, he's going to call. He might even call with hands like King Jack and King 10. I know what you're thinking. Is he really going to re-raise again on the flop with those hands? And honestly, your guess is as good as mine. I've seen worse. I've seen crazier. And uh, I'm just going to get it in here. I'm also perfectly happy doubling him up since he's given me a ton of action in the past. If he's got me, he's got me. So I move all in and I'm happy that we don't get snap called. He tells me he has two pair. That sounds like bad news, but at the same time, he's very capable of having queen four. So not really sure how to feel about the situation, but then he shows me ace four offsuit. So I know we're chopping this one up unless we find a spade and then another spade. At this point, I decided to just show the ace and let him know, hey, I've got two pair too. Seems to me like a decent idea. He's either going to put me on ace queen, ace four, or just a complete lie. But alas, my friend here is not the type to buy that crap. So he makes the call, doesn't even think too long about it. The run out comes ace queen, and I show him the chop. No blood spilled in this hand, but as you guys can see, very first hand dealt. We're both all in, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a wild ride. In the next interesting hand, there's an early position limp. The cutoff makes it $45, and I look down at pocket jacks on the button. I raise it to $165. Now the action gets to the big blind, and surprisingly, he makes the call, and everyone else makes the fold. Not really the anticipated result. I will say I was slightly concerned, because this player in the big blind who just made a $165 cold call was also a player who was not down to straddle or do any bomb pots. When someone like this calls you with a massive preflop raise, it should be triggering some alarm bells, and it definitely was for me. This could even be a hand as strong as pocket queens, ace king suited, maybe even pocket kings from this player. So 
When the flop comes down 5-4-3, under normal circumstances, I'd be pretty happy with my holding, but in this exact situation, I had no idea if I had the best hand. So when he checks it to me, I decide to just check it back and see what he does on the turn card, which is a pretty good one. It's the three of clubs pairing the bottom card. Pretty much a brick. Once again, though, he checks it over to me. Now I think he's got like ace-king suited, maybe ace-queen suited, and we could for sure use some protection against those hands. So I put in a bet of $125. My opponent makes the call, which I found interesting because if he did have ace high, I expect him to just fold, but if he does have an over pair, I expect him to just bet it on the turn once I check back the flop. So not entirely sure what he has here. I'm just gonna see what happens on the river, which is the four of spades, another good card. And when he checks it to me for a third time, he only has 300 or $350 behind. And I think I'm just gonna go for it. If he's got queens, God bless him, but he's also gonna have a lot of like pocket tens, pocket nines, maybe even pocket eights since I've been pretty active and he was starting to grow skeptical of me, I think. So I just move in and hope to get called by a worse hand. Fortunately, that's exactly what happens here. We get a dream situation when my opponent calls, I show jacks and he shows pocket tens. So we get the absolute maximum here. And I'm very fortunate to have such a nice run out on this board because there was a lot of flops that would have completely killed the action. In this next hand, we're gonna bring the focus back to the action player on my left that I mentioned earlier. I'm in the straddle in this hand and we see a $100 open from him. The big blind makes the call and I look down at red queens once again. A dream situation, even though he opened from under the gun and it's a fairly big open, he's gonna be doing this with a ton of hands as well as we have this big blind call on my direct right, which seems like dead money to me. So I'm happy to put in the raise here, make it $400 to go. The under the gun player calls without much thought and the big blind folds. So we're gonna go heads up here to a flop of jack five deuce rainbow. Now, as you guys can probably guess, this guy is the type of player who is more than willing to put in bets once he's checked too. So in a somewhat unbalanced fashion, I usually check over pairs against him and this case was no different. I check it over to him and in about 0.2 seconds, he announces all in for 1100. I couldn't call fast enough, and he couldn't show me pocket jacks fast enough. <sighs> heartbreak here. Absolute heartbreak, and we don't find any help on this run out. So we're going to double him up. But let's go. The battle has begun. A few hands later, the straddle is on, and we see an early position limp. I look down at king jack of clubs when the action gets to me in the big blind. And I don't want to complete here for $20. I want to raise it up, so I make it $100. The action player on my left makes the call, which I definitely anticipated. And the early position limper makes the call as well. The flop comes down 6-5 deuce. Pretty miserable flop for my hand. So even though we could go crazy and try to rep some over pairs across certain flops, turns, and rivers, I'm just going to check, pretty much give up here. Surprisingly, the player on my left checks. He must have absolutely nothing. And now the early position player puts in a $200 bet. However, he did this in a really weird way. I can't really describe it, but it was really quick. It seemed really forced. So even though I thought I was done with the hand, now I'm back because it just seems like he's C betting too much, too frequently, and uh, a little too aggressively. So let's see if he's actually got anything here. So I make it $800, not the best play ever, but hey, it's what I did because I just felt like it would work. Had a gut feeling, you know? I'm a gut feeling type of player. The player on my left folds, and when it gets back to the early position better, he snap folds. So good read that time. Could have been a disaster, but luckily it works out this time. In the next hand, we see a middle position open to $30. I look down at Jack 10 of diamonds in the small blind and kick it up to $120. Gets back to the middle position player and he makes the call. So heads up here, out of position, to a flop of king jack seven with one diamond. Flop a pretty good hand with middle pair, but probably can't get called by worse too frequently. So I decide to check it. My opponent checks it back. Turn card is the six of diamonds. And even though we pick up a flush draw, doesn't seem that great to bet still since we only have middle pair. And uh, I don't know, it just seems like a much easier hand to check and evaluate with. So. That's what I do, and my opponent checks it back. 
We're off to a river card, which is the beautiful Jack of Spades. I suspect we probably had the best hand anyway, since he'd probably bet a king on the turn, but just to be safe, now we have three of a kind. However, it is interesting because this card should be a lot better for his holdings than mine, so it's kind of weird for me to just come out and bet. But I mean, I'm gonna go for value here because I'm gonna feel way too stupid if he checks back like pocket tens or something. So I put in a bet of $90. Doesn't really seem like he has much, so trying to get called by a lot of hands here with a somewhat small sizing. However, my opponent does not call, but he does not fold either. We hear a raise to $320. Whatever, man. If you got a better hand than me, here's your money. I call. He doesn't seem to want to show, so I just flip it over to everyone out there who gets so mad when I don't make people show their hands. This one's for you, because guess what? We'll never know what he had. Oh, Mariano, you're such a fish. Why aren't you making people show their hands? I just don't care. All right? Don't get me all riled up in the middle of one of my vlogs. It's my style, okay? I don't make people show their hand. I don't want to hear any more about it. You're going to get banned, all right? Moving on. If it seems like I'm tilting, it's because of this next hand, all right? Here we go. I get pocket queens on the button. I raise it to $35. Action player on my left, boom, $305. Okay, yeah, sure. Make it 10 times my raise, right? Now, it gets back to me. I got like $2,000. Like I said earlier, big pocket pairs against this guy, Slam dunk, let's go. I announce all in for $2,000. He's literally gonna call me with any pocket pair, maybe any ace. I'm not lying to you guys, you're just gonna have to take my word on it. However, he's probably also gonna call with kings most of the time, and uh, yeah, this time's no exception. We're up against pocket kings. It's probably gonna get all in pre-flop against most players, but the fact that it's against him is like, what? You never expect him to have that good of a hand, and when he finally does, it just seems, man, it's just brutal. The board comes out king high, and just to add a little insult to injury, we turn a set. I guess it would have gone down this way anyway, even if I just smooth call pre-flop, since I probably wouldn't have folded just a one bet on the flop, and then, yeah, it seals the deal on the turn. We don't find the fourth queen on the river, and uh, once again, we double up our friend here. But still, like I said earlier, against these types of players, I'm happy to pay you off every single time. We are stuck now though, so in for 3,000 and we have an uphill battle ahead of us. The night is young, stay tuned, maybe we can get it back. All right, moving on to the next hand. The straddle's on and we see an early position limp before a player in middle position raises to $45. The small blind calls the $45, and then I look down at pocket eights in the big blind. Now this is an interesting spot because how strong of a hand is it really going to be from the middle position player when he barely clicks it up from the $20, he makes it $45, and then the small blind calls, I mean we're just going to have the best hand so often here that putting in a raise seems like the best thing to do. However, the downside of that is if you get called, all of a sudden you're playing this big bloated pot with a hand that's very difficult to play, especially out of position, just going to be so hard to know where we're at. So I don't think just calling is any sort of mistake. In fact, I think that's probably best, even though we know we probably have the best hand. But I'm kind of in a high variance mood now, so I decide on the former option. Let's kick the variance up. Let's gamble. $205 to go. The initial raiser makes the call while everyone else folds. So heads up here to a flop of queen nine six rainbow. And like I said earlier, these sorts of hands are just so difficult to play because do we have the best hand? Should we bet for protection? Should we just check and then fold if he bets? Should we check and call if he bets? I don't know. I mean, I just have third pair, so I check. To be honest, I'm just sort of crossing my fingers that he checks it back. And I'm happy to see that he does. So we're off to a turn card here, which is the five of spades. Now I suspect I have the best hand the majority of the time. So I put in a bet for protection since there's so many bad rivers for us. Don't have to go too big here just to fold out like ace highs and king highs and such. So I bet a third of the pot, which in this case was 170, I believe. My opponent makes a snap fold. So nice to take this one down, even though probably not the best play. However, there is a simple solution to playing middling pocket pairs, and that is to upgrade them to really big pocket pairs. So that's what I decided to do in this hand. There's a cutoff open to $60, and I look down at pocket kings on the button. 
Now here comes the special surprise in this hand. The player on my right is the same action player from earlier, but he decided to move seats to my direct right. And I quote, because Mariano, it's going to be easier to double you up if I sit on your right. Yeah, his words, not mine. I'm telling you, this guy is just one of the coolest, friendliest dudes I've ever played poker with. So when I look down at Pocket Kings, I figure, well, let's see if we can do just that. So I make it $300. He opens to 60. I make it $300. I know what you're thinking. That's massive. But uh, as you guys can probably guess by now, it's probably not an issue with this guy. And uh, indeed, that's the case because he thinks like two seconds and puts in the 300. So we're off to a flop here. Heads up of five, three, four. He checks it to me. And because he's calling with so many hands pre-flop, I'd almost rather just give off a free card and hope that he improves in some way because I feel like if I bet here, he's just going to fold so many hands. So I do just that. I check it back and we're off to a turn card, which is the three of clubs, pairing the board and adding a flush draw. Now there's quite a bit of draws out there, even though they're all low cards. Like I said, my opponent could very easily have some straight draws, some pairs, any flush draw really. And it seems like that's the case because he puts in a bet of $400. He's probably doing this with a lot of air balls, like just queen high or jack high or whatever. But he's probably also betting like hands that want to continue, such as flush draws or uh, pair plus straight draws or hands of that nature. So if he's bluffing and I move all in here, it's obviously a mistake because it shuts down all his bluffs that he would have put in on the river. However, if he has a hand like a flush draw, it would be kind of a blunder to just smooth call here because if we move all in, we could get our opponent to commit all the money to see the river card. So it's kind of a pick your poison spot. I decided on just moving all in here. Enough of the games. If he has any piece of this board, he's going to call it off. And uh, when he doesn't snap fold, it seems like that's the case. He starts tanking and thinking about it for a while and he actually asks me, do you want me to call? I have a flush draw. I just keep things honest and I say, yeah, if you have a flush draw, of course I want you to call. He's like, all right, I call. <laughs> so we're going to play this massive like $4,000 pot here. He shows king eight of clubs. So hopefully we hold just once against this player since he's been kicking my ass all night. All I want to see is a red card, please dealer. <sighs> okay, sweet. Not exactly proud of this hand because... I didn't do anything special, but I'll take it. Happy nonetheless. A funny note after this hand, earlier when he flopped a set of jacks against our pocket queens, he actually gave me a $100 chip right after the hand as like a rebate and just laughed it off. So I felt like now it was my turn to do just that. So I shoot him back the $100 chip and we got a little bit of camaraderie going as well as lots of gambling. Highly recommended. Unless you don't want it. Now, this sort of ties nicely into what happens next, which is that the rest of the table starts to refuse the straddle. They don't want to do bomb pots. They don't want to do any sort of extracurricular gambling. And as you can imagine, the action player at my table, whose name I'm not saying for obvious privacy reasons, he doesn't like this because he wants to play crazy. He wants to splash around. He wants to be at a table where everyone is engaging in the same sort of goofiness that he wants to so as you might imagine he got up and asked for a table change because our table wasn't that fun and to all of you out there who are opposed to straddling or doing bomb pots or whatever i think that's totally fine you know everyone has their different opinions on that stuff but my advice is if there's people at your game that are giving a lot of action and they want to do certain things then just do it. You know, it's going to be more fun. It's going to be good for the game. And quite frankly, it's going to keep around a player that is splashing around. Yeah, it's higher variance, but it's overall more fun. And in my opinion, it's kind of a no brainer. Anyway, so at this point, this player leaves and all of a sudden my night went from 100 miles an hour back to five miles an hour. And I'm having none of that. So I get up now and ask the floor for a table change. And they accommodate me right away. So I move over to the fun table now. I reunite with my buddy. And on top of that, everyone is straddling and doing bomb pots. Definitely my type of table. And I'm grateful to get a warm welcome in Ace King off suit. The straddle was actually off this hand because someone bought the button. Nevertheless, I raise to $35 and get called by just the big blind. 
Extending our welcome is an ace high flop, ace seven five with two spades. Big blind checks, I put in a bet of $50. Lots of hands to get value from here, such as worse aces, flush draws, straight draws, etc. My opponent makes the call, and we're off to a turn card here, which is the three of clubs. Aside from 6-4 now being the nuts, um, it shouldn't really change anything. It'd be pretty sweet if he did have a pair and clubs, though, because now he's got a flush draw as well. With so many draws and hands to get value from, when he checks it over to me, I decide to size up a little bit. I make it $175. He's only got around $550 remaining in a stack, so I'm trying to set up a river jam, but it actually doesn't come to that because after debating his options for a little bit, he announces all in. So I make the call. Would be pretty ridiculous to fold here, even though sometimes we'll be behind. In this case, that's exactly what's going on because my opponent shows us ace three offsuit. Unlucky turn card, what I thought was a pretty good one actually ends up being a disaster and uh, we don't get there on the river. So, nice hand, sir. Seems like we'll have to do a little bit of climbing back here at this new table. Now, this very next hand I did not film, so apologies in advance. I was actually taking notes about that ace-king hand when this hand went down, but I thought it was critical to the session. Uh, so, I filmed the very end of it and I'm just going to tell it back. So follow along and uh, hopefully my soothing voice will be good enough. Anyway, there's an under the gun open from the player on my direct right to $35 off of a $1,500 stack. Um, we cover this opponent and he's a pretty strong thinking player who I've actually played quite a bit against. So when I look down at Jack seven of hearts, like I've said many times, probably not recommended, but I'm in the mood to mix it up. So I make it $110. The action gets back to him and he makes the call. So we're gonna go heads up in position to a flop of king seven seven. Ah, to play bad and be rewarded. Man, it's a really good feeling. He checks it over to me. I'm gonna bet a third the size of the pot. In this case, that's 75 bucks. My opponent makes the call. Cool, he's got something. Turn cards the four of hearts. As if we needed it, we now have a flush draw to go along with our three of a kind. He checks it to me. In this spot, with pretty much all my holdings, I'd be sizing up. And I'm going to make no exception here that I actually have a hand, so I make it $375. My opponent thinks for a little bit before making the call. So at this point, I think it's pretty evident he's got like king-queen suited, king-jack suited, hands like that. So we're just looking for a clean river card to put him all in. He's only got around 1,000 or 1,100 left, which... I say only, like, that's a small check of change. That's a ton of money, but relative to the size of the pot, it's only, like, one pot-sized bet. All we need is a clean river to go all in. Unfortunately, it's the worst river in the deck. It's the ace of clubs. My opponent will almost never have an ace here, and I'll actually have one fairly often. I'm still going to move all in, but I'm going to have to do a little extra work to get called. So when I move all in, I flip over the jack of hearts. Now my opponent's brain is a little bit in the blender and I don't blame him because really once I have the jack of hearts in my hand and he can see that, he can sort of narrow my range to queen jack of hearts, jack ten of hearts, ace jack of hearts. And since there's only one of those hands that he loses to if he does have king queen, um, I think he's just got a call. That's why I showed it and it actually ended up working out because after thinking for a little bit, he does make the call. I flip over the seven and uh, you know, you could imagine his look when he sees that I'm kind of an idiot, but seems to work out this time and we win a pretty big pot. So we are back in Profitville, which ties in nicely to the very last hand of the night, which probably the craziest hand I've ever got on video. Hold on because it's going to be a crazy one and it's actually a fairly simple one. Now you guys remember the action player who I've been talking about all night and is now over at the table I'm at? Well. He took a dinner break, and upon his return, the dealer asks him, do you want to be dealt in? To which he responds, I've got to go, so deal me in, and I'm all in blind. Now, most of the table probably thinks he's joking, but if you guys have any experience with this gentleman, you'll know that it's anything but a joke. And indeed, when the dealer gives him two cards, he says, all in, without even lifting them off the table. This is about a $2,500, maybe $3,000 all in. It's hard to tell because of the way he's got his chips. Uh, they're kind of just in a pile and it's just out there for the taking. All you need to do is get dealt a good hand, right? 
Now, the player that I just beat with Jack Seven of Hearts, he's on my direct right, and he announces all in for 1500. Now it's my turn to look at some cards and see what I got dealt. And oh boy, it's Ace Queen of Clubs. Holy sh. That is such a good hand in this position because the action player is going to have literally any two cards. As such, the player on my direct right is going to have a pretty wide range here. Pretty much any pocket pair, any ace, probably any king. So you know what that means. I'm all in. And really the only thing I'm concerned with is someone behind me going all in. But that doesn't happen. And suddenly we're off to a $7,500 pot on hour 12 of this session. This is what you call make or break type of hands. All right, my heart's pumping, here we go. Dealer, put out that flop. Ooh, I'm not lucky. I got really lucky, Mariano. Not yet. Not yet. Fucking flush. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> I think I got a straight. He has a flush. Oh my god. Oh, he got a flush. He got a yeah. flush. He got a flush. <laughs> Alright, I'm done. For <laughs> oh my god. Hey, he got a fucking straight. Mario. Right, yeah. What a hand. We end up with the absolute nuts in one of the wildest hands that I've ever played, let alone captured for the vlog. At this point, both of my opponents end up leaving and that instantly changes everything about the game now that this action player has gone off into the night with a big smile on his face. Man, this guy is, he's amazing. Suddenly, my game was pretty dead and I'd also been playing for around 12 hours, so I decided to just color up and call it a night. I hope you guys enjoyed those hands because I definitely did. What a roller coaster day. Started off getting completely wrecked in the big pots, even though I won a few small ones, but then things got a little bit better and then they got a lot better once I moved over to that other table. All in all, you're looking at a 12 hour session, in for 3000 and out for 7,794. So almost a $5,000 win. And I'm thrilled with that result, not just because it's awesome to win that amount of money, of course, but also because I captured it on the vlog. I have some crazy days like these once in a while that I really wish I did have captured on camera. So to finally have done that for you guys and also for myself, uh, I'm more than thrilled with. As for right now, I'm exhausted, as you guys can probably understand. 12 hours of poker, sometimes more. Man, I don't know how you guys do it. There's a lot of people out there who play 12 hours, 15, 24, and man, that stuff is, I'm not cut out for it. So props to you guys out there. Uh, I need some sleep though. So I'm going to go do that and I'll see you guys next vlog. As always, thank you so much for the support. Thank you if you watched all the way to the end. I know this was a little bit of a longer one. Thanks a lot if you gave this video a thumbs up. That really helps me out and I appreciate it. If you like this sort of stuff, subscribe. Plenty of more vlogs to come in the future, although I'm not sure from where with the ongoing COVID situation. But uh, yeah, that's a wrap for today, guys. As always, stay safe. Good luck out there and I'll see you all at the tables. Peace. <laughs>